what's good everybody welcome back to the bake sale episode three jason i got a question for you man are you ready to rock this funky joint <laughs> i am definitely ready to rock this funky joint that's right man it's been a while but uh we made it after several cancellations you had to keep heading back into the kitchen but we're back here i know man i, I just i had to keep cooking something up and you know I, I was just taking way too long i guess it was too raw i, I really don't know what the fuck was going on and you're but... like the, the recipe the recipe isn't right man you said I, I gotta go back in the kitchen so i was like i'm, I'm there for you man i'll wait for it so, right right yeah, but here. but but we're back in the studio man ready to drop that holy intellect you know man and get all butt booty naked blessed you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man! You're gonna name you're gonna name it all, name the whole thing. If, if people don't know what we're talking about right now, then uh, you're in for a treat here. So yeah, if you just clicked on the video without actually checking out the header of the video, um, so today we're um, we're gonna be dropping some knowledge on uh, the Poor Righteous Teachers Holy Intellect album from 1990. Um, yeah, you know the crew consisting of, of course, Wise Intelligence, Culture Freedom, and Father Shahid. Uh, rest in peace to Father Shahid, who actually. I think he died in 2014 uh, in a, uh, I think he was motorcycle accident, which is actually really ironic yeah. that Father Shahid was was killed in an accident because Tony D, who is, you know, one of the most notorious producers from, you know, the whole New Jersey era, man, he was the guy that really kind of put Jersey mm. on the map. You know, he, this guy was very, very special, kind of underrated and stuff, who actually himself died in a car accident, I think in 2009. So very yeah. odd, very odd stuff happening there and shit. But um but yeah, man, I'm, I, I'm just a really, really big fan of like New Jersey hip hop from this era and stuff like that, man. Like it's always been something special to me. And I always felt like the Poor Righteous Teachers were a group that really never got their shine, even with a really big song like Rock This Funky Joint. You know, it was really well known, but it never resonated over time with people. Like it's a group that never really gets talked about mm. with the better groups of all time. And ironically enough, they're a group that dropped four really solid albums, you know, disbanded in the mid nineties, but the fact of the matter is they dropped four albums, unlike a lot of groups who dropped many less and had more exposure and stuff. But, you know, me personally, I've always thought that Wise Intelligent is one of the most underrated MCs to ever touch a mic. His solo records are really good. Um, and just as a group, man, they're always really great sonically, uh, you know, um, musically wise and stuff. And, and, and <laughs> no pun intended, but like Wise Intelligent, man, was always bringing that knowledge too, man. It was very, it was very positive yeah. and stuff. And it was, it wasn't gimmicky and shit. And I just think they're one of those really, really underrated groups. What is your history with, uh, with Poor Righteous Teacher, Teachers? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, man, they played Rock This Funky Joint all the time on Rap City. Like right. it was, it was on there all the time. And course i used to record you did as well i just record shit on vhs tape and play it over and i, I remember this song so well but uh after that yeah they kind of just sort of fell off like they had a couple other uh tracks on from this album but rock this funky joint i mean everybody knows the song if you put it on but they might not necessarily remember the group or who who made the song but right. yeah it's definitely a class classic memorable song though Right, right. Um, yeah, so yeah, Rock This Funky Joint was definitely that song kind of put... And you know, it's crazy because you mentioned it was always being played on Rap City, which is totally true, man, because this early oh, 90s, yeah. like 1990, 91, there was about... There was two or three really huge, massive songs that I always take from that era. And one of them being, of course, another group native to New Jersey, which is Naughty by Nature and OPP, which was a fucking yeah. like massive, massive pop mainstream song, which is kind of ironic again, yeah. because the album itself was nothing like the single. Right. The album was yeah. hard. It was hard, man. Um, yeah. And then you got this song, which was another one that really kind of, you know, blew up and stuff. And then there was, um, uh, I don't know, there was, there was a couple other songs from that era, man, that were just like massively huge. But I always remember this one being played constantly because it was that catchy. And it, it's just, it's so crazy that yeah. as, solid, as solid as the Poor Righteous Teachers albums were, they just, it, it, they never got that note. Uh, they just didn't get yeah. the clout, man. It's so strange because you're you're yeah. right. They they never had those those more or less playable tracks on their following albums for like the rap city and stuff. But I know the DJs yeah. they did get played on hip hop radio station stuff. But it's crazy yeah. because I think the songs are really good and stuff. And it's just it's kind of baffling to me how a group this solid could kind of float under the radar for so long. I mean, we're thirty years after thirty one years after this album debuted, almost. To the, I think it even came out in March or April of 1990. Yeah, I think it was. So it's March roughly 
May or something like yeah, right around that, right around this time anyway. Right, just they just don't yeah. get mentioned. So, but uh, did yeah, and on, it's funny on this album as well. Like you mentioned, Tony D. Like there's so many classic samples that are on this album that were later used by other artists that became way bigger songs than what are on this album. So right, right, it's kind of kind of interesting as well. Yeah, Tony D. Was definitely responsible for ten of the twelve tracks on this record. There's two songs he didn't produce, and there's actually one song in here which we'll get to that you would think that Tony D. Tony D. Actually produced, but he didn't produce, and yeah, and that'll lead me into a conversation with DITC's Diamond D. It's actually kind of interesting, but. Uh, I think musically this album's fantastic. Like, do you, did you hear this album when it first came out? Were you, yeah, like yeah, the, the actual I had the cassette? Yeah, yeah, I, I bought it when I was a little kid, and it's like, yeah. So I mean, I would just go buy every like once a week. What I would do is I would just go to the music store and I would buy something, right? And it's like I I'd heard Rock This Funky Joint, so it's like it's played all the time. So it, you know, it's got in your head. I didn't know anything about them at all at that point. I'm just a little kid, right? But yeah, so I, I actually had the cassette when it first came out. So, right, right. Um, I think I got it. I don't. I didn't get it right when it first. It was probably ninety one. I had the tape too. I got the CD later on. But you know, back in those days, it was. Yeah. You know, for us, um, purchasing cassettes was just a lot more viable because it was like half the price of a CD, right? So a lot of us yeah. did grow up on tapes because that's pretty much what you could afford. If you could buy two tapes for the price of one CD, you're going for two tapes <laughs> every yeah, time. Yeah, at that point. When I was younger too, I had convinced myself that tapes sounded better than CDs. Right. <laughs> so, so I was definitely I was buying tapes uh, every chance I got. So, yeah, right, right. That's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty funny actually, because I mean, yeah. there's always been that huge argument about vinyl versus CDs and tape. I mean, there's people that love tapes even to this day that'll even say like the analog oh, yeah. sound quality of tape is fantastic as long as the tape is new and stuff. Because tapes wear out; yeah. they technically wear out, right? So yeah, you do notice thing, the wear. Right? Yeah, you do notice the wear, yeah. but um, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so if you're not fully familiar, and I don't know why you'd be watching this video if you're not really fully familiar with uh, Poor Righteous Teachers as a group, but they're, they're basically a conscious... Just because group. they love us, man, that's why they'd be listening. I mean, right, so. right. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they jumped on that movement, you know, the conscious movement and stuff like that. I mean, their music was more or less, you know, Wise Intelligent being part of, like, the 5% Nation and stuff um, since from a very young age and stuff, but he always claimed that, like, the message in the Poor Righteous Teachers music wasn't just strictly for, you know, five for the 5 percenters it was it was like a it was more of a universal message you know it was it was a bigger picture to it and stuff it wasn't just a you know a tunnel vision type thing and stuff so which which you can kind of hear it in the music and stuff i mean they definitely bring up a whole pile of type of issues and stuff but it's it's very you know i think what they were really were trying to do is you know the idea between behind poor righteous teachers was simply that you know you could be righteous and poor and you know still accomplish your goals and stuff like that without having to throw so much negativity in your life and shit like that right so they they did they definitely thrilled the positivity in the music and stuff but but again it wasn't gimmicky that's what i liked about porridge's teacher man wise killed this shit musically like it wasn't gimmicky at all and it was it came off in the right section of conscious hip-hop and again i i'm just i can't believe how much it just got filtered you know like by compared to so many other groups that came around this time it just blows my mind but yeah yeah exactly i mean obviously like public enemy is the top of the ladder when it comes to like political type stuff and when i was a kid i i was listening i i didn't know exactly what he was talking about like and i wasn't familiar with like five percenters or anything like that but right. as time went on of course you learn about these things and this is kind of cool like the when you have an album like this when you're young as time goes on you look back at it and they say oh okay i see what he's talking about there and i i understand more about like what five percenters are and everything so yeah yeah it's very interesting to learn stuff like that when you're young especially yeah and i mean this was the era where i got interested because i didn't know what it was either right i mean you had to you heard about it you heard you know the different uh uh things that were going on and stuff and then you had to look into it and you're like oh okay that makes a lot more sense now now the music makes a lot more sense but yeah so it was you know it was learning curve really to listen to this type of stuff right yeah so yeah um and i mean he mentions as well like in parts of this like some parts he's like saying like you're thinking i'm racist and stuff but and you could see that definitely if you're just a white person you don't know anything about what he's talking about and he's he because he is throwing shots out there a lot of times and against you know, religion as well, like Christianity and right. things of that nature. So, yeah. Right. But so it know, could be controversial. Yeah. Wise Intelligent always, but he talks about it in the record quite a bit too, about how people are calling him racist stuff. And he's like, how the fuck can I be racist when I'm just reacting to, to how people are oppressing me? 
right? If you if you yeah. grow up in a community where you have a certain group of people that are oppressing you, you're going to react to it, right? It doesn't matter who you are, yeah. what color, whatever. You're just going to react to that. So, but the irony is, is that the people that are oppressing, you know, the, you know, these people in the ghettos and stuff like that were um, the same ones that were claiming, oh, well, he's just being racist. It's like, well, dude, yeah. like it has to come from somewhere. It's not like he was, and he even said that too once. He even said like, he goes, I think it's pretty pathetic and embarrassing that, you know, I'm all of a sudden in the same league as someone like Hitler. You know, if you're calling me a racist, you can, can you can put me in the same bubble as Hitler. He goes, it's totally not the same thing. He goes, I'm not racist at all. Yeah. He goes, I might have some animosity towards the people that are, you know, oppressing me and keep me down and saying the shit that they are saying about me, the police and all this type of stuff, you know, but I mean, when it comes down to it, he's still a person and he's still trying to do positive things and he doesn't want this to be the way it is. And that's what I like about yeah. Wise Intelligent. And he explains this in the music quite often. And, you know, it comes across very simple, you know, it's just. Yeah. You know, it just it's the those people that just really don't understand where the shit comes from. And that's a problem. That's yeah. a major, major fucking problem. So Yeah, and Tony D's a producer almost every track on here as well. So Yeah. Um, yeah, and well, so and white that, dude, so and, and that yeah the so white devil. White devil behind the boards, right? So <laughs> Right, right, right. Tony D the uh Italian uh producer. And like I said, you know, Tony D was one of those cats that um was doing it for years before this and stuff, and actually he actually the story behind Tony D hooking up with wise intelligence is actually kind of funny because um, they basically uh, someone told that this wise guy could rap and stuff. And Tony's like, yo man, spit some shit, man. Because wise knew that Tony was the guy to see in Jersey at the time. Right. Cause he was the guy that was yeah. putting people on and, you know, he's getting people on and, yeah. and he had dope beats. And so he goes up to wise and he's like, yo man, spit some rhymes for me. And wise is like, what the fuck is that? I'm spitting no shit, man. And then he eventually <laughs> did. And he was like, dude, you're so dope. So, they hooked up and of course he, culture was in the group at the time and the original DJ, DJ divine was part of the group and stuff. So they started doing some stuff, but, but the irony is, is that wise intelligent and um, YZ actually had beef at that time. And yeah, of course, yeah. Tony D and YZ were working together. So it was like this conflict of interest and stuff, but it never really came about anything, even though there is a couple jabs on strictly ghetto towards YZ in the record. He disses YZ and yeah. uh, I believe the EDS posse or something like that. But uh, nothing yeah, really came, or... nothing really came of it and shit. But you know, it's kind of interesting. But yeah, going back to the whole Tony D thing, you know, him being white and shit. Yeah. Like, I mean, right there, it just says it all. It's like the people that yeah. claim that Killer Mike is, you know, super racist and stuff. And I'm like, you understand what Killer Mike is about, like, you know, yeah. yeah. So he's, you know, he has a, you know, pro black agenda and stuff, but he's not racist against. Wh- he he's trying to help you know yeah black people like it's just so ridiculous and they're like oh you know he's got the white guy there is a big gimmick and i'm like man you guys know nothing about what you're seeing right now it's just absolutely crazy it's absolutely crazy but but yeah, yeah it's funny how people jump to conclusions uh based on little things like that but yeah i know it is i think that might be part partly why they didn't achieve great success maybe as well because they were kind of a misunderstood but well, you know, the thing about Poor Righteous Teachers that's actually kind of interesting is that Tony D, to me, is part of Poor, Poor Righteous Teachers because he was a big part of their development and produced for them for, oh, yeah. for a long time. Yeah, he was never considered yeah. a full-fledged member of the group. It was literally yeah. Wise uh, Culture Freedom and Father Shahid who was who became yeah. the new DJ after uh, DJ Divine. I, I think Divine recorded about four or five tracks for this record before he just kind of they they got rid of him replaced i don't really know the yeah. full story to what happened with divine and and yeah, his father shaheed came in but apparently father shaheed at the time was also a guy that was around jersey doing big things he was doing lots of shows putting lots of people on he was producing and stuff but his role came into this group as more of like we need someone djing we need someone to to oversee what's going on because apparently he did bring in help out tony d with a lot of the production and stuff too so which yeah. I th- which I believe is a little bit uncredited and shit and and actually culture freedom to put a little more backstory into the group he was a uh, he was an MC around the time too and was doing big things and stuff but you know when they really formed the group they realized that Wise Intelligent is obviously the number one MC and and really culture freedom became the number two guy he almost became a I would almost say like a flavor flay but not that type of flavor flay like he was more yeah. the ablib guys yeah, he was there so he, flavor flay like he's I, I, I don't want to say a hype man, but I mean, no. he, he wasn't on some songs. He kind of was like, he's hyping them up, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah, but so, yeah, I mean, he, I kind of wish he was more of a, a bigger part of the album as well, because 
sometimes when he does chime in and he's more more interact, it does make the song sound a little better to me. But, Honestly, but yeah, you're, you're right though. Like, why well, intelligent? You kind of have to stay the hell out of his way though, in most parts. So cause he's just ripping shit. And there is a couple tracks, you know, like Wise will rip a couple lines and then. Uh, culture freedom will come in and he'll say something and keep going back and forth and i you know me i love that yeah. back and forth style but i wish yeah. it was like you know a couple bars to a couple bars you know balance that out yeah. a little bit more yeah exactly. um yeah and i do agree that's always been one thing that's very strange about this album is that culture freedom as being as good as he was really became so much in the distance right from yeah. from wise intelligent on this record but you know with that said man we might as well get into the first track on the album uh, of course, produced by Tony D. And this is a really strange way to start your record. And there is a story behind this song, too. And it's called Can I Start This? Now, if you guys are familiar with the song, this, the song starts out with Wise Intelligent. We're basically Tony D saying, yo, man, can I get on the album or get on the verse? And this is a true story, man. Apparently, Tony D was begging Wise to get on a track. And Wise Intelligent thought he was whack as fuck. And he literally says it in the <laughs> intro of the song. He says, oh, man, okay, fine. You can get on there and, and spit your butt booty fucking rhymes or whatever he says, right? Yeah, so you're rubbish or whatever. Yeah, you're rubbish. But it was a true story because yeah. Wise Intelligent actually thought Tony D was a whack rapper. And he didn't want him on the record. Yeah. And um, so anyways, the weird thing about this track to me is the fact that Tony D's voice is pretty much the first verse you hear on the album. And it's the only feature on the record. Yeah. It's so it's so oddly placed, and it was actually the very last song that they recorded for the album. It was a filler track. It was supposed to be just whatever. And the other odd thing about the track is that Profile wanted this to be um, first on the album. That's why it's there. Profile put this song purposely. Yeah, on, that's and, weird, man. Yeah. And I'm like, why would you put Tony D rapping first on a record where it's all wise intelligent? Yeah, and you know the other th interesting. And it's thing like it's just like it's like a it's like a comedy song too. It's just a good time, fun song. Right? Yeah, you got guys, just, it's like guys just hanging in the studio, just kicking shit, right? You know, and it, it's like if you're gonna put this on the album, it's almost like a closer. Like the way the way the whole thing is introduced and everything, it's just just right. bizarre, man. Maybe even a bonus track or something, right? I know, like I just feel like it would have been kind of ironic to put this as the last song on the album called "Can I Start This?" You know, it feels yeah, more or less true. this song feels like a a posse cut because Tony D has a full verse wise intelligent raps, yeah. but then uh culture freedom actually has his only full verse on the entire album yeah. on this song. Yeah. And it, and it's dope. Yeah. Like it, it's yeah, just, it it's one of those fun, funky studio tracks. Where you're like, Hey, let's kick it and shit. There's nothing really significant about it except for the story of it. Right. The yeah. beat's dope. It's a fun track. I mean, if there was one more cat on the track, it would have been probably a really almost a memorable, you know, posse cut for myself. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's. I love the beat on this. It is good time. Like the whole song is funny to me. It's like, yeah, but it's just bizarre that they put it on to lead off the album, right? It's like, it is. I mean, eh. well, and it's funny too because they when uh, Profile told them that they wanted to put um, this song first on the album, Wise Intelligence, like I don't give a fuck. Just get the album out there so we can make <laughs> some money. He didn't even care. He's like, I don't even, I don't even want to fuck with the arrangement on the songs. Just put the album yeah. out. We need money, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting story behind that, but. Um... Yeah, but, I've yeah. seen an interview with him before, and he's like, most people think because we're poor, righteous teachers and what we're talking about, like we're, you know, from the suburbs or well-educated. He's like, we're from the projects, man. It's like, you know, we we yeah. have no money and shit at all. Like, we aren't we aren't well-to-do people here. We need fucking money from making this shit. So, yeah, well, definitely, that's, I can see that. It, it's actually, like, get this out, man. <laughs> it's actually so true, man, because, you know, you got to remember when they came up um, and when they started doing shit, man, they were right in the middle of the whole crack era, right? And Wise even talks yeah. about, like, they got a lot of their money by dealing drugs. It's something they didn't want to do, but they needed some yeah. cash so they could get some f shit going music-wise. It's just the way you had to do shit, you know, in their situation yeah. and stuff. So, you know, he doesn't really talk about it a whole lot in the music and stuff because they weren't about that. They were trying to keep shit positive and stuff, which I really, you know, I yeah. really, I like that too, man. That's kind of cool. But, I mean, it's true yeah. though, man. I mean, it's like... You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of cats that come from, you know, these type of hoods and things like that, but can keep it very positive. And they definitely did it. Yeah, man. they definitely did it, man. But yeah, you're right, though, man. Wise Intelligent yep. does come off as being very, very intelligent, the way he words things and and the way he raps and stuff and his, his ability to be so diverse. This guy yeah. can. And, you know, the crazy thing about this record, Tony D once said that every almost he said 90 percent of the verses that are spit on this album or wise intelligence first take wow like the guy was unbelievable he would never fuck up and he would just be like that's the way i want to do it and like you know there, there's certain beats like you know 
um, the reason why holy intellect came across, we'll get to that, but there's a story behind that too and stuff. But, um, yeah. So can I start this man? I, I really like the track. I think it's uh I think it's a fun one. Yeah. It's a fun. It, it's yeah. Just... I, I, I really enjoy this song. Yeah. And you know, like I said, I mean, if you, you probably know me too. I've mentioned this many, many times about, um, one of my biggest pet peeves on albums is when you, the first voice you hear on a record is a feature. It always drives me nuts yeah. for some reason. I don't know why it's just a small, weird little pet peeve I have. I just want to hear the artist that I paid the money to hear first yeah. on the album. And then you can get into some features and stuff. But me, every, I, I think it's pretty obvious how much I love Tony D. I love Tony D's solo record, man. I think it's like phenomenal. I think it's so good. Yeah. It's one of those records. So I don't, I, I'll give this one a pass. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it is strange in the whole situation. But yeah, definitely a good song, though. I like it. All right, right. So second track on the album, which is uh, the song that obviously Poor Righteous Teacher is more, most famous for, and that's Rock This Funky Joint. Um, yeah. Th- this is one of those songs that's, it, it kind of reminds me of like the whole Dale of Soul um, story too, man, because essentially what happened with this song, I mean, they put this song out, it blew the fuck up, of course. And of course, War, the group War, came a knocking at the door because they sampled yeah. they sampled sipping in the darkness and what happened here there's this story is fucking crazy so basically when they submitted the album to profile profile went and cleared a bunch of the songs they probably cleared all the ones that were cheap to clear and they just said fuck it we're not going to clear this one put it out anyways of course it backfired on them war ended up suing them and yeah. it, cre- it created this huge fucking so basically what happened was tony d was pissed off at profile because they fucked him and then the group was <laughs> uber fucking pissed off they thought it was tony d's fault because he was the producer so long story short um after the album broke and then they got sued and basically um profile had to pay like 50 percent and the group oh no poor righteous teacher the group had to pay 50 percent. tony d had to pay 25 and profile had to pay 25 back to whatever they sued him for which is which is kind of ridiculous in itself i i I can see where wise is coming from being like are you kidding me we have to pay for this shit we just rapped on the record man you guys produced and didn't clear the shit yeah but anyways, so Wise was really pissed off. And the the story goes, Wise Intelligent had nothing to do with this physically. But Culture Frieden and Father Shahid actually jumped Tony D after all this shit went down and beat the shit out of him. Because they were so oh, pissed. because wow, they actually that before. Because they actually thought that he was the issue, right? They thought he yeah. fucked up. But it was actually Profile. It's Profile's business to clear all the samples. But you know exactly what happened. If you're familiar yeah. with the record industry, this is very notorious back in these early hip-hop, like the early 90s. Record labels would clear the samples that didn't cost them that much, and they would just try yeah. to fuck. But they fucked up. They released Rock This Funky Joint as the first single. Like, what, what, what did you yeah. think was going to happen, right? Yeah, and it blew up. Like, I mean, if it hadn't have blown up like it did, then... You know, probably wouldn't have been such a big deal, but well, that, yeah, that, that was kind of the that's iron- crazy, man. I, I didn't know they I didn't know they jumped Tony D, man. I, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, again, when you come back to the the story with War, is that they actually sampled War on another song on the record too, but they never came a knocking on that yeah. one <laughs> because yeah. they probably didn't know about it, man. Yeah, exactly. So the the story goes, Tony D said it took about a year to recover, not from the beating, but it, to like salvage the relationship <laughs> and stuff, and then they just kind of got over it because I, I think they paid up their debts and then were like, okay, fuck this, man, let's. Get back to making music and then they started making their second record but it's just it's kind yeah, of a it's crazy like story one year later tony d gets out of the hospital <laughs> all right boys let's get back to the studio <laughs> right right it's <laughs> fucking ridiculous man. Uh, shit that's funny man yeah um but yeah i mean with this song immediately like you can the, the unique style of wise intelligent just shines man it's like the way his phrasing is and like uh, it's just crazy man the way he breaks stuff down Oh, dude, his flow, like I said, man, he's got one of the most overlooked style, like, flows ever. Like, he yeah. did, he really can adapt to any type of beat and stuff. And and Tony D even said, yeah. like, that's why they would try different things, like the beats would be a little bit more broken, or he would up-tempo a song like Holy Intellect just to see what he could fucking do. And he would kill it every time. Yeah. And he said, again, you know, going back to him, one take, it's like, how do you just create these styles and, and the way you're spitting your words and shit in one take and not fuck that up is just yeah. phenomenal really really is yeah, and another thing he does constantly through, throughout the song and the album is he just he's always throwing like prt and poor poor righteous teachers in the lyrics it's like it's like marketing basically the who they are constantly like over over and over it's like prt poor righteous teachers prt it's like throughout right. almost every song he's mentioning that it's hilarious right right but you know that's you, a good idea though right it's like you won't forget their name oh absolutely not absolutely not you know what i always thought man you know especially listening to this album for the last couple of weeks is 
and I, I thought this before, but it just, it kept resonating with me and it always made me laugh. But you know, when culture comes in and says, rock this funky joint, I yeah. always thought it sounded like Biz Marquis saying that shit, man. It right? does. It yeah, almost it sounds like does. they sample Biz Marquis saying that because he lowers his yeah. voice and he does this weird thing because he doesn't really sound like that all the time. And he rock this funky joint. And it sounds like Biz Marquis. And that's, that's funny too because, I mean, he did that that little part of the hook, right? Before the scratch, the scratch is cool too. Like it's yeah. really, really cool how they did that. But yeah. it's funny that he's, he's a part of at least, you know, the – part of the hook of the most popular song they've ever released basically so right right he got right. his he, he got in there on that one anyway so yeah because the actual hook is pretty cool because they obviously sample flavor flave and uh they also yeah. sample the funky four plus one um uh track also i, I think for the course so that's pretty cool man it, it's just a really yeah. really memorable song and it's one of those tracks that I never get sick of. You know, like you get sick of those songs that you were always played on Rhapsody or through the 90s. And I mean, now the song's 30 years old. We've heard it 100,000 times, but I never get yeah. sick of hearing it. It's weird. It's one of those tracks I just, I just, if I have it on the iPod random or whatever, you know, if I'm out doing whatever and shit, I don't skip it. I don't skip it, man. Yeah. This is one of those tracks. It's a fun song, right? So, yeah. Right. Yeah, it sticks with you. Very, very catchy for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Rock This Funky Joint, man. Uh, really cool track, man. Uh, get into the third track called Strictly Ghetto. Uh, this is another Tony D produced song. Um, you know, this song is is relatively, I feel like, I don't really know much story with this track, but I feel like it is basically just, you know, them, you know, hey guys, we are from the ghetto. This is what we're doing. But they're also, it's they're, they're dissing YZ in this track. I think it was just kind of an answer. Yeah. Um, and, and I believe this song was probably recorded early in the sessions, like with um, with Divine and stuff. So uh, I'm pretty, yeah, Divine actually does the cuts on this track. So so it was recorded early when that beef was still happening with YZ and stuff, which I actually thought was kind of interesting that he never really changed the lyrics to it because working with uh, with Tony D and stuff, because Tony D was still had a relationship with YZ, but he's just like, ah, fuck it. I'm going to produce this track for PTR and just have them diss YZ and... Uh, and uh, the EDS yeah. posse. That's <laughs> kind of funny. Hey, man, he's not writing the lyrics. He's just producing the song, right? So. Right, right. <laughs> but yeah, this one definitely slowed the pace down after the first two tracks. Uh, kind of disappointing that way that it, it did kind of almost bring everything to a halt because it was starting off so good. But yeah, I mean, it's not a bad song, but uh, it's funny the lyrics in this song, man. It's it's almost like it feels like almost like a freestyle or just a stream of consciousness. And where you're mentioning that he one takes it's crazy that he would just do a one take like this and right it almost does seem like a freestyle at some points you know i mean who knows man i mean like the way verse two starts it says strictly ghetto we are prt culture free divine and me you know it's funny he doesn't even change that for like when the lineup changes they just kept the song the way it was yeah right and yeah. you know i guess his scratches were on there and stuff too so there must have been no like animosity and stuff when divine left the group because they left his cuts in there and they didn't change any of that type of stuff and they kept his name in there and everything so you know for the people that yeah. pay attention to lyrics and so you're like who the fuck is divine i thought it was like father shaheed man <laughs> yeah. right it's, just, yeah, it's, exactly. it's a little bit odd but um yeah i don't really mind the song either but yeah you know it's hard to follow up a song like rock this funky joint especially like because this one isn't really overly that catchy or anything. It's just more of like, yeah, you know, it's four verses, man. It, it like every song on this record has like wise, intelligent spit in four verses. And you know, that goes back to the old uh, conversation about, you know, a 12 track album in 1990 versus a 12 track album in 2021. What a difference. Yeah. You get two oh, verses, yeah. maybe or a song, 27 minutes for 12 yeah. songs. And this is 55 minutes, you know, 12 songs. Like yeah. it's a totally different album. Like, it's two albums. Well, that's in the one. thing, man. Like, rock this funky joint is a single man it's like a five minute song right it's like you right. don't hear good that point. now ever no it's like, Jesus, good point it's crazy you know and, yeah. and generally man even in those days sometimes man they would make radio cuts like if you had they would cut certain things out not like not content but yeah. they would they would make it yeah. a little bit shorter be, for radio play yeah. because honestly i think the standard was like for radio play you wanted songs between three and four minutes that was yeah. kind of where you at because yeah like you know, three and a half minutes is pretty pretty typical right so i'm always wondering like you know if um if they cut down that track at all when they were playing because like a five minute track is is pretty insane man it's pretty it insane. is yeah yep. pretty so um but yeah strictly strictly ghetto do you got anything else on that one no man it's a it's not one of my favorite tracks on there but definitely i like his lyrics it's just like i said it's like a stream of consciousness just fucking crazy shit he's like 
Why, yes, I'm the teacher that be teaching, and everybody listens when poor righteous teacher speaking. Stop, look, observe, my piasi be thinking of the butt nudie, butt, butt booty stinking. It's like, it's just crazy, man, those lyrics. I just love the way he flows so much. Right, right. Uh, speaking yeah. of flowing, man, speaking of flowing, so we get to the uh, the title track of the album called Holy Intellect. And, you know, if you know anything about producing and beats and BPMs and stuff, like the majority of the songs on this record are probably, I don't know, 90 to 95 BPMs kind of thing. And then this one like really stands out at like 105 to 110. It's way up pace. It almost feels like a house track. And it the, does. the story behind this track is that... Um, Tony D just really wanted to hear what Wise Intelligent could do with a faster beat because he wasn't really rhyming over anything like this. And this is what yeah. he did with it. And it's stupid. Like he fucking absolutely obliterates this track, man. I think his flow yeah, is another and, like four verse track, right? Dude. Like, and, it, it, he, and he almost changes it up on every verse, but like it's really crazy how he keeps that flow and it flows so well. He never. Yeah. Like everything is in sync so perfect man it's just such a great flow man but i thought that was interesting because um wise intelligent actually never liked this song until later he he started liking it after he kind of started to appreciate what it what tony had done for it you know switch it up a little bit but give it a little bit different kind of flow it is interesting that they did yeah. this for the title track because a lot of people will go yeah. into like holy until like you remember this song because it's the title track but it's so different than the rest of the album i mean it's not like yeah. a complete house track like a craig g album but yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's like, but this, like, this is crazy. I love listening to this track because I just can't believe how wise intelligent is just tearing this apart yeah. so fluently. It's nuts. It's a great track. Yeah. I like when he said, it's amazing how my thoughts can be wrote to perform. I was like, yeah, I'm thinking the same thing, man. It's how do you perform this shit? Right. <laughs> but yeah, it is crazy. Pretty crazy track that way for sure. But I just can't even imagine sitting in the studio with, um, with wise intelligent and him ripping these verses without fucking it up at all. I'm yeah. Like, really? Like, dude, like that's insane, man. It's insane. Um, it is. and I love the course, man. Like this is father Shahid. Like father Shahid is not on the record a lot. Like physically, like he's, he has a double, couple courses that he did. They left in a bunch of the divine stuff on here, but this is one of the tracks that he actually did. So he scratches in, you know, the, um, the, the Holy, Holy, it's all right. And stuff like that, which is really cool. Yeah. But yeah, so, yeah, definitely a, a different feeling track for sure. But yeah, I always I like, like it though. I, I think it's really cool. I think it's very unique. I mean, it, it's either going to be one of those songs where it really works or it just doesn't work at all. And I feel like in this yeah. case, oddly enough, because it really does stick out on the whole album, and uh, it's it's ballsy to to do this type of track when it's the title track too. But yeah. uh, I yeah, love the sure. drums. I love the way a lot of these type of tracks usually have pretty weak drums because the beat's a little bit faster. You can't incorporate that, you know, that harder kick and yeah. stuff. But the drums actually play pretty well in this, man. They did a good job mixing this down. So pretty cool. We are frozen. You're back. She, yeah, you froze too. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> That's going to happen, I guess. Uh, stupid Skype with videos, man. It's just the way it happens. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, that's Holy yeah. Intellect. Moving along into track five, which is uh, Shakala. And now, this is one of those tracks where I couldn't remember if this was a single or not. And so, I had to look that up. And it turns out it actually wasn't a single. <laughs> so. But but they had, a, they had like, the, the second version on their next album, like Shakila. It's the same, same shit, but it's, like, a different... Yeah, different track that's on their second album. I th and I think it was a single on that album, wasn't it? It might have been actually. I, think I don't it was. I don't remember. Oh, I forgot. Which to... is weird to me. I don't I didn't understand why they did that, but <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to mention actually Holy Intellect was the second um single off the album. Yeah. Yeah, it was which a is too. a very interesting choice after Rock This Funky Joint because that's the follow-up. You got to remember this is how people would really kind of, you know, maybe buy the album based off of me that second single kind of thing is don't want to buy the album for one song kind of thing, but but yeah, yeah, no, this song right here is quite interesting that it's not a uh, single because it just feels like it should be. You know, back in 1990, this song, the sample wasn't as common. We yeah. all we all know the 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 Zap sample now. Uh, it's been yeah. used so many damn times. So like when you hear it 30 years later, you're like, oh, it's that Zap sample. It is what it is. But 1990 was pretty damn fresh and it must have sounded pretty cool. And this was kind yeah. of, this is one of those tracks where wise intelligent claims that he wrote this song when he was about 14 15 years old and it's actually about nobody specific he was just writing a song about a like a fictitious girl 
uh, and about a monogamous relationship and stuff. And he was just playing the role. He just wanted a girlfriend. He it was this hot. It was this thoughts on paper, and he just wrote this song about Shakala, and that's really what the whole song is. And I'm like, that's so crazy. He was like 14. He wrote that shit. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> crazy dude. I mean, it's not dirty or nothing, but you know the story goes like Tony D said. You know maybe we should incorporate kind of a you know not a softer song but like everybody was kind of doing those songs but he didn't want yeah. something cheesy like ll's you know fucking yeah. i need i need a love song and shit so we'll do this but they picked the right sample i mean i need a love is probably one of the fucking cheesiest songs ever made <laughs> like by one of the dopest rappers too right like i mean come on ll yeah. that, that's just cheap but this doesn't come off feeling cheap or cheesy at all i feel i feel like it comes off no. It's not honestly one of my favorite tracks to listen to because I'd rather listen to the more up tempo stuff and a little bit harder stuff. But I, I always like this track. Yeah. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, for what it is, definitely, it's not like you said. It's not a cheesy song. It sounds genuine, but it, it yeah, does. it's funny. He wrote it at such a young age, for sure, man. That is that is funny. It is crazy, man. It is crazy. Yeah, he was like fourteen years yeah. old, and I was like, yep. Yeah. Oh, actually, the other notable thing in this track too is the um, the the chorus is actually sung by Culture. He actually sings that. He actually yeah. he does a bunch of the courses, and then I he was. I need you, girl. I right? love you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine sitting in the studio one day and you're like, "Why is this like, yo? We need this course, culture. You're up, man. You're up. You're up." And he's like, "What do you mean? Well, you, you need to sing the course, man." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it kind of. Like, oh shit. It kind of comes out of left field, right? Like, I mean, I don't know if he was really singing before, if it was part of his repertoire as a musician, but he does it here. It doesn't sound like it, but I mean, he pulled it off as far as, you know, as good as he could. But, they did. Yeah, some, it's, not, they, it's not horrible or anything. They did some tweaking, man. This is way before uh, all the auto-tune and shit like that. You had to EQ yeah. the shit out of that and actually just put type different types yeah. of effects on it. <laughs> just yeah, reverb exactly. the shit out of that. Just reverb the shit out of that. It'll work. It'll work. <laughs> yeah, if this was this was made today, the auto tune would come in key on that track for sure. Yeah, it's still, I still think auto tune might even be one of the worst inventions ever. Like it just yeah. it wasn't used properly because it was suppo- yeah. it was invented to be used to like literally to correct things. But yeah. people overdid it and it became this ro- it became ro- like a robotic course. Yeah and versus yeah, people like people just start, yeah, it's crazy i don't want to get into that conversation but yeah. um but yeah shakala uh so get into uh track six which is time to say peace um this is another tony d track and this is actually one of the first songs that uh they recorded together this was actually recorded back in 1988 with another song on the album that actually made the record um which I can't remember what it is right now. I'm slipping my mind. But anyways, this was one of the songs that they recorded, which made the album two years later. They released this as a single uh, in 89 and then made the record. So, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, this is a cool track. I mean, it's got got nice horns in the chorus there. Boost things up a bit. And and, uh, I like the, it's just a simple loop, you know, has nice scratching. So yeah, really cool musically, I thought. You know, I never really thought about it until again recently because I never really knew the time frame of when it was recorded, but it was recorded in 1988 and to come out in 1990 and still sound super hella fresh in 1980 goes to show you really how genius Tony D was. I mean, you got to remember yeah. 1988 to 1990 in reality is so different. Like the, the is, beat, yeah. like if you look at the grand scheme of things, man, not a lot of people could record shit in 1988 and release in 1990 and be like, yo, that's fresh 1990 shit. It doesn't work like that half the time. But Tony D was just ahead yeah. of the curve, and it just makes it sound really fucking nice. And um, I know Divine, of course, was on this because it's one one of the earlier tracks. But what I, what I was alluding to was, you know, Wise mentions a lot in this in this song, and I think in a couple other songs too. He keeps saying, you know, a tribe called PTR, and I never really thought about it. I just thought, you know, he was just using Tribe Called Quest, you know, in his rhymes and Tribe Called PTR and shit. And I was like. But then when I know the dates on this, he's this was recorded in 1988. This is like pre Tribe Called Quest, so isn't it's just yeah. kind of an interesting line that he repeats a few times, like you know Tribe Called PTR. I'm like that's just PRT, crazy. Yeah. Or PRT, yeah. Sorry, I, yeah. <laughs> you know You're what I meant. PTR on PTR. Uh, what is that, man? PTR. I don't know why I'm uh, saying PTR. I think, I think you know, it's. Yeah, I was thinking of something else, but yeah. PRT. PTR. I probably PRT, said that. I, yeah. I've been probably saying PTR the whole time, too, and not even thinking about it. But yeah, PRT. So, but a tribe called PRT. And I just picked it up when you were saying this, but yeah, you might have said it earlier. I don't know. But I just got you saying it here a few times. So I was like, better, better interrupt in there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> make the edit. <laughs> I think everyone gets the point. But uh, yeah, I just thought it was kind of an interesting line yeah. and, and way to phrase things like a tribe called PRT. And this is like pre tribe called Quest. 
right? It's very yeah. similar, and it's kind of interesting. I don't know if there's. I, I, it might just be completely coincidental. I don't know. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure. I'm sure it is because Tribe Called Quest was actually a thing in 1988. They just were kind of breaking out, kind of doing yeah. their thing, but. Um, yeah. but I actually really like the song, well, man. Just knowing the history was recorded and like how it fits onto the record just blows my mind. It's crazy. Yeah. One thing I thought was interesting when I was a kid, I remember this when he says, uh, praises are due to the arm, leg, leg, arm, head to Allah. If you're mentally ill, it's like, I picked that up when I was a kid when he said Allah, it's like, oh, it's arm, A L L A H Allah. So yeah, it's pretty funny how he spelled that out. Like the, when uh, I right. was a kid when I, I realized it, a lot of people say that now, of course, but you right, know right. what it is, but yeah. But back then, it was just a little thing that I picked up. I thought it was really cool. Um, track seven, man, style dropped, lessons taught. Um, this is actually pretty. Uh, this is a pretty cool track, man. Um, there's yeah, actually, it starts out like the diss track. <laughs> right, right. Um, there's actually a remix of this too that was released on the rare and unreleased. Um, I think it's like I think it says it's like a UK uh, release. Or I don't know what that entitles. I don't think I ever really looked at the credits and stuff, but it says like UK remix or something. So I don't know. Um, okay. I can't remember. I'd have to go back and listen to it. I have it. I just can't remember exactly what it sounds like right now. But uh, I know that Tony D always said that it was like a crazy dope remix that they'd never released until I, I don't remember when the rare unreleased album came out, but sometime in the two yeah. thousands, but I have it somewhere, but, um, but yeah, this is, this is one of those songs I actually really enjoy, man. It, it kind of, it just fits in the album perfectly. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. I really like this one as well. He's like talking about Tim Baylor's a failure. <laughs> right, right. It's funny. It's funny how he keeps dropping in these little shots at people in there. Oh, dude, right shots there. all over the fucking place on this one, man. But again, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, again, with the with the content, man, it's like styles drop, lessons taught, man. I mean, this is literally what they were doing. They were always just dropping knowledge and, and teaching and shit like that. And it, it's very self-explanatory. So Yeah. Yeah, the final verse is pretty crazy on this. He's like, feel the vibe from the crescent of Wise's brain. Drop in pain if you claim to entertain. Power spoken, savage tamed, smooth and plain. So, yeah, I mean, it's like the last verse is pretty damn good. The whole thing is, but I, I really enjoyed that part. Yeah, did you mention Did you mention the Tim Baylor thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Tim Baylor. Yeah, that's right, okay. I couldn't remember if it was someone else. But, yeah, no, the Tim Baylor thing is awesome, man. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> It's good shit, man. But yeah, I, I think Wise like destroys this track, man. It's fucking dope. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, so track number eight is called "Speaking Upon a Black Man." This is the first track on the record that's produced by Eric I G Gray. Um, and you know, it, it fits in perfectly, man. Like I know Tony D even said these like the the two tracks that he did on this record fit in so perfectly. Like he just had mm. really really good production and it just fit in the album perfectly and he, he actually really likes these tracks himself so um and i believe this is actually wise intelligence favorite song on the album also he claims it's his favorite song oh, on the really? record so yeah mm. it's probably just it, it's probably more lyrically i would assume maybe maybe the lyrics just have a little bit more but i mean it's you yeah know, it, it is what it is speaking upon a black man i mean again he's just wearing his heart on the sleeve here and, and going at it right and stuff so um yeah you know about proud being black and you should be too you know, you should honestly trust your instincts and be proud to be what you are and stuff like that. And yeah. I, I love that. And the cuts are great too. And stuff. It's just, it's, it's one of those tracks where, you know, you, you feel everything that he's saying, man, it really is. But again, you know, it's, it's not gimmicky. It's, it's not like overly like, it, it's not like, I don't even know how to explain it. It doesn't really have the catchiness to it all that much, yeah. but it really does work though. It's yeah. It's, it's just con conveying the message is what this track is about. Right. It's like, I can imagine like, Obviously, listening to this, I was a little kid growing up in rural Nova Scotia, Canada, right? Mm -hmm. like, so right. it doesn't it doesn't hit me like I'm I'm trying to learn and listen to what he's saying, of course. But I mean, and this is one that he's taking shots at religion as well, like Christianity. He's like, yo, take off your cross, black, because it's crossing up your mental, like little things like that. If you were if you were a black kid in in the ghetto or in his situation, it's like that would definitely like all you would be taking it in. It's like, damn, he's right, you know. And it's like I want to, I want to 
get on this path that he's on. So yeah, it's very very positive message, and you know it can be a little controversial if you're it looking is, at it if you're looking at it that way. But, yeah, yeah, if you're if you're a Christian, true. you might get a little bit um, offended by what he's yeah. saying. You know, like certain things about you know giving their give them back their Bible because it's unable to solve them. You know, things like that. And yeah. but I think that yeah. where he's coming from, he's basically saying you know it's like he's seen the bad that's coming out of this. You know, the hypocrisy of yeah. religion and stuff like that too. How it's changing people and how it's promising it's false prophets and shit like that. Right. I, I completely understand yeah. where he's coming from. And it's like, man, you got to trust yeah. your own. You got to be your own fucking person. And that that's his outlet. You know, you got, you got to speak on something that is bugging you. And it just happened to be the Christianity religion and stuff, which, you know, I mean, I've always said too, yeah. you know, it's like a lot of religion is there's a lot of hypocrisy there, man. And it, it is one oh, of those, yeah. it's one of those things that does cause a lot of battles. I mean, it causes a lot of wars. It causes a lot of deaths and shit like that. And it's like, you know, I mean, yeah. it's a totally, I don't want to get deep into religion, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I can <laughs> see where he's coming from if you're opposed to it and you see how it's yeah. affecting your, you know, your, uh, your surroundings, your people and, and things like that. Right. Yeah. Completely. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, so next track, track number nine is called so many teachers. Of course. Right. It has, they have to have a song on the album called so many teachers, man. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the amount of time he says teaching and teachers throughout this album, I actually thought I should count how many times he references teaching or teachers throughout the album. It's got to be in the hundreds, man. It's hilarious how many times he says teachers and teaching. I like. But, I yeah. think. I think. I think he disses Christians on this one too, doesn't he? Or maybe. I think maybe. I think uh, maybe he maybe he pokes the thing at. I can't remember, but I feel like he's basically just coming from the point of view of like. You know, there's so many people out there that that have a voice, but are really not saying anything worthy of teaching people the correct yeah. lessons and stuff. And that's there's so many people in this world, and like it's kind of ironic a little bit because when you look at his point of view from 1990 before the explosion of social media and stuff, it's so relevant mm. to today because everybody and their dog have a voice because everybody has the capabilities of being out there in two seconds on social media and stuff like that. Like that's the problem yeah. is that, but you know, today's world, nobody really has a real voice. Everyone's just a fucking bunch of sheep, man. They just follow the norm. Like, Oh, I like this. I like this. You know, I'll believe this and shit like that. But he saw the hypocrisy yep. in it way back in the day and shit like that. It's like, you need to have real fucking teachers. I, I think, I think this song would have been amazing if he had a mentioned Karis one's name, at least once in it. Like we need fucking yeah. real teachers like Karis one, but I get what he's saying. You know, it's like, there's just there's so many fucking phony ass bitches out there, you know. It's, they talk a lot of shit, man, but it it's not the real, man. It's not real. Well, the thing now with like social media, it's like an echo chamber. Like everybody has their view, and then they go on social media and they they group together with people that have the exact same opinion as they do, yeah. and it makes it their life easy, right? Because then they just attack other people <laughs> rather well, than trying to learn or yeah. look at different viewpoints, right? It's, it's like, this whole it's this whole ideology. It's pointless. Of- it has it's this whole ideology of like power and numbers if i can get like 400 people on my side and i get all these likes i get it more out there but it's just about proving this one it's not about solving anything you have to listen to reason and and discuss things you have to be able to debate these you have to allow other opinions to come in to really solve things because if you're just looking at it from one side what is that doing all you're doing is creating mobs and you're just gangster advising everything man that's all you're doing yeah like it's fucking and if you're and even just listening to the lyrics on this album if you say if you're just a white dude listening to this album you're like oh he's racist oh he's against christianity what a piece of shit you know it's like then you go find more people that see think the same way and it doesn't solve anything you have to try to take their viewpoint and see where he's coming from and i think that's like albums like this help me understand that as a little kid because i mean absolutely you grow up listening to this type of music and you're not involved in their culture at all like you either try to learn about it or you just disregard it. And so I'm just lucky I enjoyed the music and I tried to learn more about it and where they're coming from. So it is interesting That's... because it is true, man. This was like, th- these were the real reality lessons growing up and stuff, because once you learned about yeah. the stuff, you went and did research, you went and looked into it and you deciphered, you yeah. know, what you wanted, you know, how you're going to believe it, not even believe it, but just, you know, take in the information and absorb it and stuff like that. But yeah. it really, it really does help. And that's why I feel like a lot of people that grew up listening to hip hop music and, and understood these cultures and stuff like the shit that's going on now, which has always been going on, you know, with the police brutality, like all these types of social issues that are really yeah. out there and stuff. This shit's been going on for a long time. And, you know, people are like, Oh, I can't believe, you know this and that and i'm like guys this has been going on forever 
It's always, yep. we've known this, but people don't, they're like, why is it just being publicized? And I'm like, it's because the platforms are a lot bigger, man. People yeah. weren't listening to everybody's words back in the day because it wasn't that platform, right? Why yeah. would fucking Betty fucking Joanne be listening to the shit in what some white <laughs> suburb? Like, it just doesn't make sense, right? I mean, but, you know, the point is, is that, you know, I think just having a better understanding really, really helped us for the future, man. It's like... You know, there's yeah. just, there's so many people out there just not willing to even learn any of that shit, but it, it is what it is. And I'm glad this stuff exists yeah. out there, man. You tell people, go back and listen to this stuff, how relevant it is. It's yeah. crazy how yeah, fucking exactly. relevant this shit is. And it's just, it goes to prove that the world really doesn't change. You know, we got yep. basically all we're doing these days is just canceling people. Everybody's getting canceled because they said one thing 15 years ago or did this and that. It's getting to the point where when you have Mr. Potato Head being canceled from cultures, like what a, where like what is the real problem here man it's not mr yeah. potato head dude it's not mr potato head there's a bigger problem here you know it's yep. been talked about for years but you disregarded it so long that unfortunately you became part of the problem by doing that yeah it is it is strange how things are attacked now and it's uh, it's out of hand at this point it's like they talk about burning books and now we're just canceling everything off platforms everywhere so nobody has a voice that's so, different than the mainstream platform voice Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. And you know what? I made a joke. Um, I don't know, man, probably maybe a year ago, maybe, maybe under a year ago. I don't even know about how this whole cancel culture is going to start getting ridiculous to the point where I feel like they're going to go into the vaults of films and start editing out movies for re-release and stuff like, you know, taking movies yep. back in the eighties that use the word homo and fag over time. And, yep. and, and, and you know what? They're actually doing it now. The studios mm -hmm. are going in and removing language based on from movies that are 30, 40 years old. And I'm like, yeah. why? Like, it's, you know, it, it's so, it's getting to the point where, like, where are you going to stop this, man? Like, live yeah. in it now. Don't worry about that shit in the past. Like, it is what it is. That's not going to yep. change anything. That's not going to change anything. No, it's not. It's not going to change anything at all. It's just... <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's gone too far at this point. I, there's no turning back. It's, it's just... Pete, this is the way that it's going. It's almost non-stoppable. It's crazy. It is, it, it is actually blowing my mind a little bit. It's pretty nuts. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, just with this track, the only other thing I know to be get off on a tangent there, but uh, Culture Freedom actually got involved on this one a little bit more, which is really cool. I, I like that he was in in the mix here a little bit more. So, yeah. right. Yeah, they do that kind of back and forth. He has like a one liner here and there and stuff, and it's yeah, fucking dope, dude. It's dope. Yeah, I just, like we said, I just would have sent it more because I think it would have elevated the tracks a little bit more. Right, right. Mm. Yeah, I, I totally agree, man. I think that's one of the biggest, uh, you know, small gripes I have with this record. I mean, it's 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 a good thing that Wise Intelligent is so damn strong, you know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think it could have been a lot better, you know, a better yeah. of a product. You just have more culture in there because I think he's good, man. He definitely has that voice. Yep. I mean, at times he can sound yeah, just definitely. like Bismarcky, and I have no problems with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, so getting into the next track, which is uh, "Words," uh, "Word from the Wise," which is also produced by Eric IQ Gray. Um, this song right here has probably one of the most iconic sample. I mean, this song has been this sample has been used tons and tons i don't know how much it was yeah. used pre-1990 but it's the famous the boss james brown sample and stuff i believe they even yeah. sample like malcolm x in this and, and stuff also so yeah uh, he's on the intro and there's also a little oh, part in the song and in interlude so i think there's yeah, actually yeah, malcolm x yeah there's and i believe that's actually um father shaheed brought all that apparently had like all the uh, malcolm x and like um farrakhan records and shit like that and he brought those reading yeah, okay. they sampled those straight from uh, vinyl and stuff like that which is really cool but nice. but getting back to the top of the the show when i mentioned um you know that i bring up ditc and and apparently diamond d had a conversation with tony d one time saying there's no way that you didn't produce this song based on the sample that's totally <laughs> something that tony d would do and he was like convinced that he had produced this song and he's like no it was actually eric gray who produced the song <laughs> he's fucking crazy dude like really that's funny yeah so i mean yeah it's just it's a very very recognizable song and again you know yeah. going back to 1990 like i don't know how much it had been used this blatantly it probably even chopped up a little bit before that but this is like very blatant um um you know yeah. sample the way it's used by the boss and stuff but i i love this track man it's always one that it kind of sticks out to me on the but i'm a big fan of the sample you know so but why yeah. is it so good on this man i love the samples the the malcolm x samples in here and the farrakhan samples work perfectly in this um 
Yeah. It's just great. I mean, this is all, I mean, the song is, you know, about the injustice. This song right here is very, very relevant. Again, like the whole record is super relevant, but this is like one of those songs where it's just like, it's timeless. It's literally timeless lyrically. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a good track. He's like on there. He's as well, like saying man was given law, not religion, things like that. So definitely uh, another another one with a lot of a lot of meaning in there. Yeah, there's a lot of layers to this, man. Again, you know, you just when you hear when you hear Wise Intelligent saying what he's saying, you can just you can feel the emotion, man, and it's just coming across so clear too. It's it's crazy, man. That's what I love about him, man. It's just not, he doesn't have to do anything gimmicky. He's just like, fuck it. This is how it's going to be. It's great. Yeah. And uh, it just works, man. It just really, really works. But. Yeah. Great song. Really, really great song. Um, track 11, uh, which is called, which I mentioned off the top of the show too, which is uh, Butt Booty Naked Bless. Uh, this is the other song that was recorded in 1988. Um, apparently I was having a brain fart. I was having a booty fart back then. But yeah, no, this is one of the, <laughs> This is one of the first but three songs. Naked so- Booty Bless for it. Yeah. So this is one of the three songs that was recorded back in 1980. Two of them made the album. The other song was uh, Word is Bond, which you can find, I believe, on the Rare and Unreleased. They eventually released that one. Um, but yeah, I always thought this was so funny because the song has nothing to do with fucking, you know, naked booties and butts at all. It, it's just kind of funny because with that title, you think, holy shit, man, they made like an ass shaking song. Nope. <laughs> Yeah. It, hey, it, man, it, it could be like a dance hit on the album, though, right? So maybe it is. It is like, maybe that's maybe it's like the double meaning. Right? <laughs> it is. Well, I think the idea behind it was to to give that title. It, it's a really catchy title. It's in a way, it's kind of being a little bit ironic. Again, it's a little bit gimmicky because the idea was, you know, to tell the truth, like tell the truth, truth totally stripped down. That was the idea behind this. Just be very, very yeah. blunt about what you're saying. Hence, but booty naked, bless. But it also comes from this ridiculous story about in Jersey. How I guess, I guess, in the hood at the time, man, a lot of people were smoking fucking weed laced with embalming fluid, and the yeah, shit would yeah. lit. The shit would literally make you get naked and run up and down the streets. Oh, and that's yeah. it's actually so it yeah. does have a do- double meaning. And he, <laughs> and wise, intelligent, and fucking Tony D, they were saying that like. He said it was so funny because the cops would show up and they would always have extra blankets in the in the back seats for all these people that were fucking running around <laughs> naked and shit to, to cover them up. <laughs> oh, like, shit, that's funny, he's man. He's like, that's how fucking, that's how big of a problem the embalming fluid weed uh, joints were, man, yeah. is that they had he's to have like, extra boys, blankets. You get the blankets, boys? <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, this song right here, I mean, it definitely doesn't sound as 1990-ish as... Um, as uh what was the other I, I'm, I'm uh time to say peace and um yeah this one does sound a little bit older but i think that's kind of adding to the mystique of it too because like i said with the double meaning you know it, it has everything to do with you know stripped down truth and it kind of gives this vibe that it's going to be this booty song but the beat i think kind of fits in that realm of uh irony a little bit so it's kind of funny yeah yeah, it's funny. Like they go, but naked booty, blessing the horn. <laughs> it's like it's fun. just but, a funny, funny musical song. But the way it is musically just cracks me up. It, it is, man. It is. It, it comes off as being like super funny, and uh, yeah, you know. But it's like at the same time, it's being like super serious at the same time. That's why I think this is one of the more fun songs on the record. But you can't, you can kind of decipher yeah. that it was recorded a little bit earlier, but uh, just based yeah. on the tempo yeah, of it and stuff has that and. Sound. Right. And, yeah. but, but it is musically actually pretty damn good. You put this into 1988, if they released this in 1988, which they did in 89, but in 88, it would have been like, whoa, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. It, it kind of comes off yep, sounding sure. like some fucking ultra magnetic MC shit a little bit. You know? it's, yeah. I don't know what it is, man. It just has that kind of appeal to it, but, um, throw cool Keith on there. You got to hit. Oh, fuck. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, and then the last track on the album, which is called, uh, poor righteous teachers, you know, it has to be called, they had to have a song called that. Uh, I know yeah. this is uh, Tony D's favorite song on the album. Um, he thinks the best song on the album is uh, uh, "Rock This Funky Joint," but this is his favorite song on the album. Um, I yeah, thought it was, this is one of my favorites as well. I thought this was kind of an interesting choice to put at the end of the album because it's it's a little bit slower. Yeah. It's got this really interesting Quincy Jones sample and stuff, and it's it's really it, they really break this one down. It, it's just an interesting yeah. way. But, you know, the more I think about it, I think it's actually a good choice to put this at the end of the album because it just kind of, it's kind of like just laying it out. It just feels like you're just putting yeah. it to rest. I don't know what it is about it, but this is a cool track, though. 
Yeah, definitely. It's funny, like, Culture Freedom, he seems like he's almost like a cheerleader on this track. He's like, after every verse, he's like, tell me, he wants more, basically. He's like, yeah, I'm still thirsting for another verse. Kick me another one. <laughs> right, right. It's kind of kind of funny. Yeah. But, yeah, Wise well, Intelligent, man, he, he goes in on this for sure. Oh, dude, it's it's crazy, man. I just, the lyrics are nuts in this track. Um, yeah. I mean, all I can say, man, you know, if you really want to, if you're, if you never heard this album and you, and you like what you're hearing, man, you got it. You got to listen to this record, man. I think, I think, you know, truly is one of those kind of overlooked, I hate using the word underrated because I feel like it's just more overlooked as an album. Most hip hop yeah. heads know Rock This Funky Joint. They probably don't know the album that much and, or the work that they did yeah. after. And it, it's kind of a damn shame because I just, it's like an anomaly in hip hop, man. There's so many groups out there that had one album that you know their fucking name, or they had two albums, like the Artifacts, another yeah. group from New Jersey, which are like, I yeah. love the Artifacts, man. They have two albums, even though L Day and fucking Tame One have had extensive solo careers and are still doing shit to this yeah. day. As a group, they put out two albums, and they're everyone always mentions the Artifacts, man. You know, and yeah. it's crazy, but like this is a group that had four solid records in my opinion and just overlooked and even wise's first like a solo album that he dropped in the 90s too was fucking great too man that's another like total underrated gem and i highly recommend people yeah. seeking that one out too but if you're into this type of conscious one, hip-hop the one you released up. a couple years ago is pretty crazy too yeah that's right man he well which one because he released the one with uh with jensu dean uh, yeah, yeah, the Gensu Dean one is the one I'm talking dude, about. Dude, I love that, that album. Crazy, I, lo- I actually have the yeah. vinyl. The vinyl, and it's a it's a gold record. I love it. Yeah, I, like seeing an actual gold record makes me laugh, and it instantly makes <laughs> yeah. me think of fucking CB4 when they go into the <laughs> office and and and, yeah. and, and uh, dudes like spray painting the record, yeah. literally spray painting in gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's hilarious. Man, actually, CB4 is getting a Blu-ray release, so that's really cool. So, oh, really? Yeah, I'll have to upgrade that because I, I haven't love that seen movie. that for years, man. That's oh, it's crazy. It's I watched it a few years ago again, and it's still funny as hell, man. Like one of my favorite yeah. parts in the movie that no one ever really brings up it being that funny, but it's like when they're sitting in the in the biscuit place, and this dude's like. <laughs> is listening to them talking shit and he's like yo man where do i know your voice from and it was the dude from like the 1-800 piss line or whatever yeah yeah. and he's like and he says it a couple times he's like yo turn around and eat your big ass biscuit and the way he says it, <laughs> it fucking kills me every time because the biscuit is literally like the size of a cake it's so fucking big right it's such a funny uh, part man it's hilarious man <laughs> it's so fucking funny dude oh, it kills me oh, every time shit. I'm gonna have to watch that again soon, man. That's hilarious. Oh, it's so good, man. It's so good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, if you had to rate the album, what is your rating on Poor Righteous Teachers Holy Intellect from 1991, courtesy of Profile wow. Records? I'm dropping a solid eight on this one. Um, I I'm gonna come in at a nine on this one. I you know I think I listened to this album so much in the last three weeks. I just like. I couldn't stop listening to it, dude. It's so, it's really damn good. It's structured really good. You know, for a 55 yeah. minute album, it never really seems to, it won't, okay, for 12 songs being 55 minutes. And that really does put it in perspective how long this, the songs actually are, right? They're all like yeah. four to five minutes yeah. long. It never seems to get boring. Like it never has any downplay, doesn't have any dumb skits that are not needed. It's to the point in every song. Like I feel like it flows for a 55 minute album so well so well and yeah i give him mad props for it man but you know i i just wish culture was on a little bit more and stuff but you know i i yeah. do think sonically the music level is really damn good again tony d just incredibly underrated as a producer like have you ever heard tony d's ever mentioned in like maybe in conversations about jersey no. pioneers but in like general production like he was doing no. shit right up until he died man it was just crazy like mm. he produced a lot of stuff but man I, you know yep. he really helped shape that whole jersey you know 80s and 90s wave and there's so many artists that came out of there like we mentioned the artifacts to you know to the whole yeah. um you know naughty by nature to fucking you know th- that whole crew man with queen latif and apache and like everybody and the- there's just millions of guys that came out of jersey it's just nuts the whole outlaws yeah. crew man like um pace one and um and those cats man rod digging it's crazy yeah. so many man so many cats man but really cool stuff uh, yeah, and like with the, like we were saying with this, the tracks on here are like routinely like long, like they're five minutes tracks, like a five minute single. Like I wonder if you took this and just let a kid now listen to it, if they would say this is way too goddamn long. 
like this song is way too long or if they would just if it would just go by because to me like you're saying the album does flow pretty well and yeah. the songs never feel like oh this this should be cut short here like you never feel that way because of the the verses that wise intelligence kicking out here it's like i never feel bored at all you know what it is though verses. it's because most structured songs even from this era were probably more three verse songs the reason why this yeah. album flows so well is because he would have that fourth verse Right. And it would just, it would extend the song a little bit, but he would have shorter verses, but you know, it would make up that time where say, if you're listening to a short dog record in 1990 and you had three minutes of beat at the end of the track, if you never got any of that breakdown, he filled in the gaps with these verses. So, you know, doing an extra verse on each track is a lot of work for an MC, but at the same time, it really fills it in. And it goes from like the end of the track to the next song. And you're like, shit man that's an incredible construction to the record i love the arrangement of it i think it's fantastic and you know the more i the more i used to think i used to not think that it was the way they placed the last song on the record i didn't think it was the greatest choice but the more i listened Mm. to it you know this time around because i didn't listen to the whole album in a long time you know got a lot of albums behind me i listened to a lot of music so and but like listening to it and really appreciating how they constructed this i was like that's a really cool choice to end an album on i think that's a perfect way to end it yeah Right, especially yeah, I, after I like that as well. the almost comedic butt booty naked bless, right? Yeah, it's kind of a it's like a perfect contrast, and I think it's really cool. Yep, definitely. So, so, what would you say your top three tracks would be on here? Um, I am going with I got to go with Rock This Funky Joint, man. Rock This Funky Joint. So yeah, I love the track. I think it's incredible. Uh, this is probably an oddball choice, but I really, really dig the shit out of Holy Intellect. I think that's such a switch up. It's such an interestingly odd track that works, and that's what it is for me. I think his flow on there is incredible, and uh, I probably got to go with Word of uh, Word from the Wise Man. I, I'm a big fan of that okay. sample, and I love that track. And I, yeah. I know those. Th- that's not really probably out of the norm from what a lot of people would pick, but that's just that's just what I came up with for my three tracks. And even though there's not a song on this record I don't like, I can listen to every song on here. Uh, speaking upon a black man, I really like that track too, um, from Eric Gray. That that's a really dope track too. So I mean I could have had two yep. that wouldn't that have been ironic. I love Tony D so much and I would have had two Eric Gray's tracks in my top three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I just thought it's of that funny. right now. That would have been crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. But yeah, I'd probably I go with Rock This Funky Joint as well. I mean you have to throw that in there. It's just such a memorable track. Mm-hmm. And it, it you never get bored of it really for how many times you hear it. And uh, then I'd go with uh, Styles Drop, Lessons Taught, and the closer of the album, Poor Righteous Teachers, yeah, is my I, top three. I, I, you know, it's weird. I figured that you were going to go with Poor Righteous Teachers, man. Like, just yeah, I, it, I even like when I was thinking lot. about my three tracks, I'm like, I think Jay's going to have this song in his three tracks. It's pretty <laughs> crazy, so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. that's cool, man. Yeah. Cool. yeah, it was fun revisiting this album, because like you, I haven't listened to the whole thing for a long time either. So yeah, definitely, definitely enjoyed this. Yeah, you know, another interesting factoid of... Um, uh, like how Poor Righteous Teachers ended up getting signed to Profile. So they had recorded a couple songs um, for like a different uh, record company that we'd mentioned earlier and stuff. And it wasn't Profile that like, they didn't really bring that to Profile. Basically what happened was they had the single. They had the single with the two tracks and um, DJ Red Alert yeah. started playing them on the radio. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yep. And that's how Profile, somebody from Profile actually heard the records and they're like, oh man, we need to get these guys on. And they originally were signed to a single deal. And then they spit yeah. some shit for them and they're like, yo man, we already have like five more songs recorded for this. And they're like, hey, if you guys are already that deep into this, let's sign you to an album deal. And then that was yeah. literally it, man. Like that's a weird way of being signed from the radio. They got signed from songs being played on the fucking radio. So that's why they yeah, always credit crazy. their whole career to DJ... Um, to red alert yeah so. yeah that's pretty crazy how stuff like that could happen back then but it's not like that anymore for but, sure <laughs> you know for nowadays i mean there's such a there's such an oversaturation of music could you imagine like you would have oh, to be yeah. the one in the the needle in the haystack to get signed like that now say if like you're yeah an independent radio like i mean i used to do you know college radio for a lot of years and play a lot yeah. of new music and stuff a lot of independent stuff i mean but the chances of like anybody here like there's just so much music out there you could never hear all that shit mm. i mean you might you might be randomly listen to the radio one day and go oh that's really dope who the fuck are these cats man it might happen yeah. it's probably more likely to happen back in those days considering the amounts of radio stations that were actually playing hip-hop you know to the masses yeah. right it wasn't that common yeah. it wasn't that common but now fuck man you got 
got guys uploading mixes on YouTube every day. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's just, it's everywhere, dude. It's everywhere. So, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's strange how in such a short time, how, how the whole industry has changed so much. Like, well, it's not that long, man. Like 1990s, not that long ago when, no. in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> it really isn't. It really yeah, isn't. It's crazy. And, and you know, it's like DJ Premier said, man, from Live from Headquarters, it's like he has so much new music to go through every week because he wants to play a lot of new music because he likes to support the yeah. new artists and get a lot of, he'll do his old school songs, what he always does. But he his the yeah. point of Live from the Headquarters is to get the music out there and play the shit that he likes. Yeah. He says that he has so much fucking shit coming in and a lot of it is really good and he can't play it all. Like, there's yeah. so much music. Like, I'm like, dude, you got to yeah. start playing. Go from a two-hour show, your DJ fucking premiere. Start playing, like, a six-hour yeah. show, for fuck's sakes, and get the shit out there. Like, <laughs> crazy. Could you imagine? He'd be like, nah, fuck that shit, man. Yeah, no, no, no. No. Yeah, that's no, funny, man. No, I, I get it, man. But, yeah, he, he does. It is, like, to his credit, though, man, he does break a lot of new songs and put on a lot of artists that we like that most people ne- don't hear, right? So it is. it's really cool what he does for people. So, yeah. Just with that one show. Well, I like the fact that like Primo is super old school. He respects the art architecture because he comes from that era. He plays that shit, yeah. but he really does really want these new artists to be doing some things too. And I love that about yeah. him, man. He's older and he still understands that he was that yeah. cat one day. He was that yeah. cat, you know, at one time and you know, he's helping out these cats and shit and it's, it's fucking cool, man. It's really cool. And yeah. you can tell he just loves doing it too. He's always hyped up and shit. He's it's great. Yeah. It's really, really great. So, yeah, oh. definitely hip hop needs a guy like that to run things. So yeah, definitely good to see. All right, so that is wow. We went a little bit longer than fifty eight minutes from our previous. Yeah, day. we went on some rants and some tangents through this, but uh, yeah, it was a good time though. Yeah, I just felt like I'd listened to the record so much, and um, it just there was things to say. There were some funny stories and stuff, and I knew you were going to bring up some lyrics and shit, which I kind of feel like that's your part. So, um, but yeah, man, it's just a just a really really great album you got you got to check it out if you've never heard it before i'm sure like i said most people watching this have probably heard it but you know yeah. if you haven't listened to it in a while recheck it out man it does still yeah. it musically it still sounds amazing it's got a really good mix on it man it's really well mixed you know so yeah. um but yeah anyways guys that's gonna do it here for the bake sale episode three we're yeah, gonna... man, the dog, dogs are barking they want to get back in the kitchen already so. i know i can fucking hear one of my dogs scratching out there motherfucker yeah. man uh but yeah <laughs> we, we got to get back in the kitchen cook something up i have no idea what we're going to be doing next we might do something new old maybe both i have no idea what we're doing um but uh if you guys have any ideas drop comments down below and uh yeah we'll talk to you guys later Definitely.